My neighbor Gary has lived across the street from our house ever since we moved in. He's a nice guy, like perennially nice. Never has a bad word to say about anyone, always sees the best in people. He never fails to see things in a positive light and has been a welcome fixture at every barbecue or block party we've ever thrown. But this latest crisis has been pretty hard on Gary and his family, and over the past few weeks I've noticed some pretty disturbing changes in his behavior. Changes that have meant that Gary went from being the Ned Flanders personality clone we love so much to being someone that I'm quite frankly terrified of. I remember when we first heard rumors of a lockdown coming, Gary came over to talk about it. He was his usual jolly self, laughing off the scaremongering coming from the media, but as we talked about a shortage on food and hand sanitizer becoming a reality, he grew unsettled in a way I'd never really seen before. Gary has two young kids, but he also has his elderly mother living with him. He once told me he just didn't have the heart to put her in a home, how that seemed way too much like abandonment. Gary was just that kind of guy. At least, he was that kind of guy. I only really started noticing the change when he came home one day with a trunk loaded with groceries. Not just the trunk, either. The back seat of his SUV was overloaded with paper grocery bags. Some were loaded with meat and vegetables, some stacked entirely full of canned goods, but it was the box full of hand sanitizer that really made me take notice. Gary was the polar opposite of a germaphobe. Like, polar opposite. He routinely ignored the five-second rule when it came to barbecue items dropped into lawn grass, and was very much of the opinion that letting kids play outside, letting them eat a little dirt from time to time, was just good for their immune system. It'd make them tough in a way that playing with screens just wouldn't. We actually used to laugh at people who kept those little Purell bottles and hip holsters, overly paranoid losers who would drive their cars off a bridge if they really knew how many microorganisms lived in their eyelashes alone. But here Gary was, unloading an entire pallet of hand sanitizer from his truck. Got some to spare, huh, buddy? I shouted over from my porch. Not at the prices I just paid, he replied. Seems... Innocuous, I know, but if you knew Gary, you'd be just as interested to note that this reply didn't come with a smile or a chuckle. He barely even looked at me as he took the supplies inside. But things only really took a turn for the worse when one of Gary's kids took a tumble while playing in the street outside their house. They were playing on the new bike, riding around in circles when I guess they just lost their balance and fell hard onto the concrete. You could tell it was a bad fall from the way they let out this pained, shocked cry before bursting into tears. My wife was out on the porch at the time, sipping an iced tea and saw the whole thing. I had heard the scream but wasn't sure what happened until I saw my wife grabbing the first aid kit we keep in a kitchen cabinet. I followed her outside into the street but as she approached Gary's kid, the man himself was stood in his front doorway. In the sternest voice I'd ever heard out of the man, he told my wife to get away from his kid. I guess she understand what he meant. As she stopped just short of the crying child, took a few steps back and then slid the first aid kid across the concrete in her direction. Gary's other kid was old enough to know what that first aid kit was, but as he tried to pick it up off the ground, Gary erupted at him to not touch that frickin' thing and to get back inside the house. My wife apologized for her hastiness, but assured Gary she had the best of intentions. And for the first time in four or five years since we'd moved into the neighborhood, I actually found myself getting angry with him. He didn't even acknowledge my wife's apology, giving us both a contemptuous look as he closed and locked the front door behind him. A few days later, we saw the same kid who fell wearing a makeshift sling and looked pretty miserable. It took us a while to put two and two together, but we did, and we realized that Gary hadn't, nor had any intention of taking his kid to the hospital to get their arm looked at by a doctor. It was only then did it really hit me just how bad this whole pandemic thing was affecting him. He wasn't just taking precautions as the rest of us were. He seemed to be going full-on survivalist, 
like the guy's entire personality had shifted over what was apparently just the course of a week or so. It was disconcerting to say the least. Then, just a few nights ago, my wife shook me awake to tell me she could smell something burning. I literally fell out of bed thinking she was telling me our house was on fire, but she assured me it wasn't and that she could just smell something. As my senses came to life, I began to be able to smell it too, this acrid, smoky smell that was obviously something being burned. It only took me one look out of our bedroom window to tell me where it was coming from, an orange glow emanating from across the street. There was a fire in Gary's backyard. The smell wasn't just bothering us either. Almost every bedroom light of every house in the block was switched on, and I could see some similarly irritated neighbors floating by their windows trying to find out where the stench was coming from. I decided to just suck it up, go over, and ask him to put the fire out. God knows what he was burning, but I knew from the smell that it wasn't healthy. But no sooner had I crossed onto Gary's half of the street, he appears from his backyard gate. At least I figured it was Gary. I couldn't see his face. It was covered up with one of those old Gulf War era gas masks, the kind with the big round glass eyes that made him look more simian than human. That, along with the 12 gauge shotgun that he had firmly in his grip, sent a shiver of fear running through me. Get away from my house, Martin! His words were muffled by the mask, but it was clear what he said. Gary, buddy, that fire is. Get away from my house, Martin! He never called me Martin, always Marty. It was the first time I'd ever heard him call me by my actual name. I just did the smart thing. I backed off, hands raised, slow enough to keep him from freaking out and shooting me dead right there in the street. I haven't talked to or seen Gary for the past few days, and I'm more than willing to give him the space he and his family need, if that's what it takes for him to stay sane. But please, if any of your neighbors are suffering right now, please reach out to see if they're okay, if they need anything at all even if it is just for you to keep your distance. I'm sure Gary will be fine in time when all of this stuff has calmed down. I hope he returns to be the man I once knew and loved. Have y'all been following all these Zoom and Skype dates that have been happening since the lockdown started? As you imagine, the use of dating apps have skyrocketed since the government had ordered us all inside for the foreseeable future. Those who would usually flaunt their game in the club or at the gym are now forced to use the same tactics as the less socially adept of us in dating apps. And although I'm not entirely happy with the increased competition, I'd be lying if I said my match count hasn't bumped up a little. Silver linings, right? Anyway, instead of using Tinder or Hinge with their increased emphasis on physical appearances, definitely not my strong point given I'm about 30 pounds overweight right now, I opted for Reddit's R4R forum, which is full of posts from those who want to hook up for conversation, flirting, and occasionally even more. So, I put up this pretty dumb post, basically asking if there were any girls that wanted to have like a lockdown date or whatever. I listed a bunch of my interests, mainly horror movies and a few political issues close to my heart, and implored anyone who identified with them to get in touch. One or two girls did, and I feel mean admitting this, but they just didn't seem particularly engaging. Nice, yes, charming, one really was, but our talks didn't light a fire in me. Not like the message I got in the wee small hours of the morning when I was up way past my usual bedtime. The message from a girl named Amber who wrote eloquently and charmingly about how she too was looking for something of a lockdown bay herself. She was highly politically involved as she put it which definitely sparked my interest in sharp comparison with the two other girls who wrote back to me who didn't seem interested in politics. She was also extremely intelligent. The way she was able to articulate her thoughts was something I had rarely encountered in online interactions which is also why I was so shocked when I found out she was only 18, 11 years my junior. Only, when she described herself, 
I started to get suspicious. She seemed perfect. Too perfect. She told me she was 5'7", Asian American, fit, and toned from yoga and spin class. In her own words, she was pretty cute. Catfish was the first thought that came to my mind. There was absolutely no way a girl as cute sounding as that would be getting in contact with me. So I just made a joke about it. Well, a joke that wasn't really a joke. I basically called her out on it. How she didn't have to pretend to be some hot Asian girl just to get my attention. Not with the kind of conversational skills that she did. The next message was just a link to an Imgur photo. A risky click, if ever there was one, as there was absolutely nothing in the way of a caption to clue me into what the picture was of. But I suppose curiosity just got the better of me, and I just clicked. For those that don't already know, a verification photo is when a person handwrites their username or other pertinent information on a piece of paper to prove that they are indeed who they say they are. And yep, you guessed it, the picture was verification. As it turned out, Amber was exactly who she claimed to be. Young, Asian, and impossibly gorgeous. I mean, I was literally stunned when I saw that picture of her. I just stopped and stared for what seemed like minutes. When it came to returning the favor, I was terrified. I am not in the least bit confident about my appearance, as I've made clear, and the idea of trying to take a selfie, something I'd never even done before that evening, was almost too much to bear. But I did it anyway. I combed my hair, washed my face, then went over my beard with the barely used trimmer my mom bought me for my 28th birthday, basically her way of telling me to get that stuff off my face. Then, when I was done, I found my angle, took the photo, and then sent it over. The suspense, the raw suspense, oh my god. I honestly think the last time I was that nervous was before my first date I ever went on as a 17-year-old in high school. I'm talking that heart-racing, sweaty palm, time-slowing-down nervous that makes you feel sick to your stomach. I was convinced I'd never hear from her again, that she'd see how mismatched this whole thing was and just up and ghost me. Only, she didn't. She actually replied saying that I was cute. That was three weeks ago now. We've talked every single day since then, sometimes having multiple hour-long phone calls that run into the wee small hours of the morning. And the more we talked, the more serious things became. At one point, Amber asked where she saw this going after lockdown was over. She told me she was living in Portland, whereas I was all the way over in the greater Boston area, pretty much opposite ends of the country to one another, but she pretty much straight up raised the issue of us needing to act on the chemistry we had. I told her that money was no object, that she was legit the most beautiful, charming young woman I'd ever met in my entire life. It was true, I meant every word of it, but I understood when she told me that she heard that kind of thing all the time, that they'd tell her just about anything to get the chance to sleep with her, and I believe that too. She asked me how far I'd be willing to go to prove myself to her. I told her as far as she needed me to go. At that, she just laughed, telling me how she doubted it. I was indignant. I'd do anything, everything she asked just to make her believe it. That's when she told me to get a knife. I'm ashamed to say that there was barely any hesitation, I just trusted her. I trusted that she knew what was best for me. She already seemed to be able to read me like a book. She asked if I had an envelope handy. I told her yes, that I had a pack of about a hundred crisp white envelopes. She told me to open it. I obeyed. She told me to place the blade of the knife onto my palm. I obeyed. And when she finally gave me the order... I pulled the blade across my flesh and let fresh blood flow onto the open envelope. It didn't even hurt. It was the strangest thing, but for the first few minutes there was no pain at all. Just this dull, hot feeling as I watched the blood flow from the open wound, staining the perfect white of the paper a deep crimson. I held everything up to the webcam, showing her exactly how far I was willing to go for her. And oh my god, the look on her face... The way her pretty almond eyes seemed to light up, it just filled me with joy. I don't really know why I'm telling you this. 
I know it's making me sound crazy just as much as it's making her sound toxic, but in that moment, it all just made so much sense. Words are cheap, actions count for something, and there's no dearer currency than our own lifeblood. It seemed like the purest act of devotion imaginable, and for a while, I saw nothing wrong with it and had zero regrets. When it was done, she told me to buy a larger plastic envelope, one that'll properly conceal the blood-filled paper one. Then I was to mail it to her. Again, it made a lot of sense. It was possible to fake something like that, I mean, pretty easily, so the idea that she wanted to see for herself, to verify that I'd be true to her, it was just second nature. As instructed, I paid extra for next day delivery, a lot extra, but it would be worth it. I felt like every penny I spent on this girl was worth it. Money can't buy something like we shared, at least. That's the way it felt at the time. I remember being so excited at the prospect of her opening that envelope, of seeing her satisfaction at knowing what I'd done for her. And when she saw, when she showed me her opening that thing over webcam, it was every bit as disgustingly glorious as I imagined. Her eyes lit up in that same adorable way, and she smiled in a way I'd never quite seen before. Such a wide, white smile. She giggled as she held it up, bringing a hand to her mouth, and in one fluid motion, she brought the blood-stained envelope to her lips and kissed it. Only, she didn't just kiss it. I watched transfixed as she began to lick at the dried bloodstains, spitting on them and lathering them with her tongue until the dried mess hydrated and formed a sticky crimson residue. Now writing this now, it's really obviously disgusting, but at the time, it seemed like love. It was the purest act of acceptance of another living being I'd ever witnessed. She was purporting to adore the very blood that ran through my veins, that even in a dried up, crusty state, she could invigorate it. It said so much with so little. The next day, we got into a conversation about cats. Amber loved kitties, as she put it. She had a bunch of clothes with cat designs on them, hair accessories that resembled cat girls. It was a whole theme for her. But since she was in college, living in a dorm room that she was basically trapped in due to lockdown, there was no way of her getting to own one. Now, for the first time being away, I confess that since my last girlfriend had broken up with me and moved out, I'd strongly been considering getting a pet to combat the crushing loneliness that came with a lifestyle such as mine. This revelation delighted her, and she asked if I would go get her one. I was confused at first, thinking we meant she wanted me to, like, send her a cat. I didn't think this was entirely out of the question. I mean, animal shelters would still need to run despite the COVID thing. There had to be a way I could find an animal shelter in her area and arrange to have one dropped off. But obviously, that's not what she meant at all. She wanted me to get a cat. I acquiesced to the idea pretty quickly. It did suit my plans, after all. But then the conversation took a weird turn. She asked me if I love kitties, so I told her yes. The truth is, I don't like them as much as dogs, but I wasn't about to overcomplicate the situation by saying that. And then she asked me which I liked more, her or cats. Again, I said her. Then she asked if I loved enough to hurt something innocent. I hesitated, but again, I said yes. Then came those fatal words that now don't seem so loving anymore. Prove it, she told me, in no uncertain terms, that she wanted me to prove that I loved her more than any other living creature. She didn't want me to get into any trouble to ruin my career by getting a criminal record or anything, but she still wanted proof. It was horrifying, listening to her talk. She had obviously thought this out, maybe even long in advance. She told me I could get a really old cat from a rescue center, one that was near the end of its life anyway, one that might well be suffering from joint pain or breathing trouble. She told me to look at it like an act of mercy, one that would prove I was the right man for her, one that could make difficult decisions and own them too. And I'm ashamed to admit, I agreed to every word. 
I found that local animal shelters in my area were still indeed operating. I called one to ask them a few questions regarding the adoption process and found it would be infinitely easier than I even expected. I could pay them a visit and leave with the cat the very same day. Then it came to asking my own rather tailored set of questions. I told her that I wanted to give an older kitty a comfortable time in its twilight years, that I was something of a feline philanthropist and had been doing so for many years. It was heart-wrenching, hearing that rescue center worker telling me what a good person I was, how no one wanted to adopt the older cats and how one would be so, so happy to have finally found someone to take care of them. I think that's what did it. The sobering moment that made me realize how stupid I'd been these past few weeks. How lust and desire and loneliness had driven me to the point where I was willing to relinquish my entire humanity. I had never hurt so much as a fly in my entire life and there I was, planning to hurt an innocent, essentially defenseless animal. I knew I had to do something. I opted for a clean break. I thought about writing her a long goodbye message, explaining how I'd come to that decision, hoping it wouldn't hurt her feelings too much, but then, it occurred to me that she didn't really have feelings, not like you or I might do. She had a fixation on what she could do. It all made sense in that context. She got off on power, on manipulation, and any way she could achieve that was justified. I blocked her on Discord, deleted the email account I'd used to send her long stream of consciousness letters from. It hurt. It hurt really, really bad at first, but once I told myself she'd easily find a new partner, a new victim, the decisions became much, much easier to deal with. So please, people, learn from my stupid, short-sighted mistakes. Don't let this lockdown loneliness get the better of you, because... There are people out there, bad people, just waiting to exploit it. I live here in New Zealand and late in 2018 I was feeling sort of lonely, so I decided to download the dating app Tinder to try and find myself a nice guy to go on a few dates with, maybe even find myself a long term boyfriend out of it. I ended up matching with this guy who'd come over from Australia and we chatted for two weeks before we finally met up. The conversation was quite light, nothing too heavy and it was fun. Like I said, it was from Australia so we talked about Aussie things and I remember telling him how much I wanted to visit Melbourne. He said that he'd been there once or twice and started making recommendations for some great coffee shops that he knew of. He seemed like a nice, normal guy and... When we agreed to meet, I was happy to do that. But then maybe five days or so before we were due to meet, he got really persistent and impatient. He would text me multiple times in a day, and if I didn't reply straight away, he would ask if something was wrong. And I thought it was weird that he was being so clingy after starting off so confident. He kept trying to bring the date forward so we could meet up sooner and would totally forget if I had told him I was busy on a particular day almost like he wasn't paying attention or didn't care about what I had to say. It was honestly really unusual for someone to be that persistent with me. I've had guys before who are maybe a bit persistent, but only out of a nervous excitement, a different kind of excited than this Aussie guy seemed to be. I just couldn't understand why it was that he could not possibly wait until the Sunday that we'd arranged to meet, it felt very narcissistic and I should have seen it as the red flag that it was and just not met up with him at all. I had the messages saved on my phone for a while, so I have a record of the exact dates and times that he sent some of his messages. So on the 2nd of December, he messaged me just after 9am saying, Good morning, how is you? And again about an hour and a half later. I didn't reply to the first message because I was asleep and I think he took it the wrong way because he said it was fine if I'd changed my mind and didn't feel like going on the date. That was when I messaged him back and confirmed that I would meet him later on that day. We met up and went to a place called Revelry. It's a very standard bar, very popular, and lots of people go there, but it's definitely more of a nighttime bar. 
I had never drunk there during the afternoon or the daytime, but it was open, seemed like it had a chill atmosphere, and he wanted to go there, so that's where we went. He was a bit bigger than the pictures on his Tinder profile showed, and it was obvious that he had put on a little bit of weight. He had big, distinctive eyes, and he was very, very clean cut. I mean, like his clothes looked freshly washed and ironed. He was also very well groomed, obviously took good care of his skin and stuff like that, like he was really good looking. I remember asking him a lot of different questions and he just sort of talked at me. He tried to ask me a few questions, but they weren't very in-depth ones. I thought he was a bit nervous to be honest, but that's not unusual for a first date. But things started to sort of unravel at one point because... He had said one thing in messages about where he worked and a different thing on the date. I started to feel a bit uneasy, like I wanted to trust him, but as soon as he started to put on some inconsistencies, I began to wonder if he was just lying about stuff to impress me. Because he was from Australia, I asked him the whereabouts that he had met his Kiwi friends, and he told me that all of his friends were police officers or somehow involved in law enforcement. He said how he had met with them while out drinking in various bars, how they'd gotten to know each other over time, and they regularly invited him back to their places for barbecues and stuff like that. He also mentioned that his best friend from Australia was coming over to be a Crown Court prosecutor. That's when I noticed that a lot of the stuff that he was talking about kind of had this running theme to it. It kind of seemed like he was obsessed with that sort of thing, which, in hindsight, explains an awful lot. I think he was sort of trying to process some of the things that he had been up to over the previous few days and it came out in his conversation style. He obviously thought an awful lot about policemen, dead bodies and ways people can be killed, prosecution, justice and the court system and it just came out in a very strange way like that on our first date. Like I said before, we talked quite a lot about him being friends with lots of different policemen and he went into quite a bit of depths regarding the details of certain investigations that they'd apparently shared with him. He said they were having a really tough time around that time because of bodies going missing in the Waitakere Ranges. He told me that police corpse sniffing dogs can only detect decaying flesh about four feet deep under the soil, so if the bodies are buried any deeper than that, the police won't be able to find them. I thought it was a bit of a morbid thing to talk about on a first date, but it was an interesting fact nonetheless. We also got into a conversation about all the different kinds of poisonous snakes in Australia, and he became quite animated about that. He obviously had a passion for the natural world. It was quite out there, but I thought it was cute. I love animals too, so I was glad we had something in common, and it made me feel a bit more relaxed again. But then... Right as I started feeling comfortable with him again, he started telling me this really bizarre and creepy story. He told me how crazy it is that a guy can make one little mistake and then go to jail for the rest of his life for it. He went on to tell me about this guy he knew back in Oz who had consensual intimacy involving choking with his girlfriend and had ended up accidentally killing her in the process. He assured me that the whole thing was a horrible, tragic accident how things just went wrong suddenly and how the guy was really upset because he loved her and would never hurt her on purpose. But still, the guy got done for manslaughter and was sent to prison for a long, long time. What I know now is this could have been him testing out his story on me. When he was able to see that I was a bit uncomfortable with what he was saying, he tried to change the subject so we could talk about more mundane things. I didn't try to make a swift exit or anything, I am quite used to dealing with all sorts of people, and I'm not saying people who talk about dark things on the first date are like bad people or anything, but it was definitely weird. We hung out for a while, but after about three hours or so I made some excuse as to why I had to leave and we said goodbye. As we were parting ways, he said, my car is this way, and pointed off down a particular road. My car was down that same road, but by that stage... I was feeling uneasy and my instincts had just kicked in telling me to walk a different way. He was also a lot bigger than me so if something went wrong I knew I wouldn't be able to defend myself. In hindsight it was a good decision. It was my intuition sense. My brain was saying this was strange, that was strange. And looking back on it now it is really strange to think of who he actually was. 
I don't think it is in the realm of what normal human brains can comprehend, but just the day before we met up, the guy I was out on that first date with had murdered a girl in his hotel room, a British girl called Grace Mullane. The reason he brought up his friend accidentally strangling his girlfriend is because that's exactly how he'd killed her, although whether or not it was on purpose is another question entirely. Also, the reason he'd mentioned the Waitakere mountain range is because that's where he ended up disposing of her body, and all that other stuff about sniffer dogs was research that he'd been doing the previous night that was still sort of consuming his mind. It is hard to look back and think that that had just happened to her. From what I understand, while we were on our date, her body was still in that hotel room of his, hidden under the bed or something, wrapped in a blanket. There's nothing I could have done, and I know that now, but it is still really hard to come to terms with that. I do think if it had been a date in the evening, potentially I could have been a victim. I take a lot of solace in the fact that I do have my wits about me and do take safety and online dating quite seriously, and that is nothing against any women who are willing to go home with someone on the first date, but I do want to say to young women to take one more step in your thinking when you are on a date to see how well you know this person actually. Since then, I have been on dates with lovely, trustworthy men, but think, how well do I really know them? It has made me go a little slower and divulge a little less personal information to them. I know in modern dating it is quite common to give people your Instagram handle, but you are giving people access to a lot of personal information. It is really dangerous and I just want to encourage people to take a step back and think before they do that. There's nothing wrong with taking a step back, taking it slow and pacing yourself a bit. Alcohol has a big effect. It is a part of the social fabric of dating and part of life these days, but it still comes with a massive risk. Women need to be really aware of how much they are drinking on dates and unfortunately drinks are sometimes spiked. We live in this world where people are still idealistic about how things should be on dates, but incidents like these take things back 10 or 20 years where women are still having to grip their keys between their fingers or can't leave a drink on the table. We aren't as developed as we think we are in areas such as dating. Technology has got ahead of us, I think people are as they always are. I think with the advancement of technology we thought we would become more refined, but we are just the same but with new technology. I think the invention of dating apps is a wonderful thing, and I wouldn't want to live in a world without that, but I just wish for a world where women don't have to think about their safety all the time.